Hello, welcome to day 98, 365 days toward racial change. My name is Tom Lenz Nyback, and we're here discussing black issues in America, how blacks are getting along, how blacks survive, how we're coming out from under abuse, uh, poverty, discrimination, racism, um, uh, some of the more grosser details of black life, of slavery, castration, rape, um, separation of families, marginalization, Jim Crow, uh, hundreds of years of this abuse over time, the whole institution. Uh, in some ways, it's still alive and kicking and breathing today. So we want to be here just to educate ourselves and find our own truth so we, we can have a, a, some better support, make better informed decisions about bringing change to our own lives. Today's kind of a good day to me. I, I'm, I'm anxious to confront a, a Sambo in my life. We, um, we're we going through Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, and we're un, un, untangling uh, some issues with Uncle Tom and how Uncle Tom is used in a pejorative way in American culture, and we're untangling that piece by piece, little by little, just to fast forward a little bit, a, little bit, a Sambo and a Quimbo type uh, character has risen in my life, and today I'm, uh, hopefully I'm going to run into him, I've got some uh, methods in store, and we're going to see what happens, I'll keep you updated on how that goes. Two thoughts emerge as I go through this project. First thought has two parts. First part is, does the slave mind get uh, transferred from generation to generation? Does it prevail? Is it, being, is it a conditioning that blacks are passing on in their treatment of one another, in the raising of their children, in their approach to economics, all of the above? Okay, second uh, part is, does the white mind of entitlement, anticipation, of uh, favor, uh, power, you know, exercising you know, authority uh, get passed on from generation to generation. Uh, is it imputed to them naturally, or are they earning um, some of the respect in these, uh, these power structures that they create and inhabit and then try to uh, subject others under uh, you know, interesting questions. So we're walking through. We got a whole year to walk through this stuff. Although we are in April, uh, so we're a quarter of the way. You better get to some serious arguments. You know, we're going through a series right now uh, about the signers of the Declaration of Independence, uh, but we'll, which is very important, I believe, because we're talking about the foundation of the nation. The nation isn't the geography. And the people, the nation is the document that governs, you know, you want some change in the nation, then you, you're going to have to come and be, come with some creative arguments from the documents. You know, this nation lives and thrives on that. Um, look at business structures, how they work, and, and, and this nation's very uh, paper conscious of about uh, what is real and what is not, fiat, uh, if you're familiar with that term. I'm inspired by a man named Dr. Claude Anderson. I understand he has chimed in on the Nipsey Hussle assassination, I'm going to call it. You know, <laughs> you know, niggas think it's still the 80s where you can just get a disagreement, get mad enough, get a gun and just kill somebody off, you know. And in this case, it kind of backfired. I hate to use that terminology, but now uh, Mr. Hustle is a, a martyr, and uh, somehow his work and legacy is going to continue, especially if Dr. Anderson is chiming in on it and making some public. Uh, you know, I'm not as... My life doesn't intersect with the black community in that way. I've come through a different route. Everybody's got their own issues. It doesn't mean that I don't have to navigate racism 
and and whatnot, a lot of those issues in my life. Uh, everybody's coming from different places. So anyway, you know, that's the uh, thought about Nipsey Hussle and uh, Dr. Anderson. I forgot the first, I forgot to give you my second thought. The first thought had two parts. We talked about that. White and black conditioning. Mental, primarily. But the second thought is uh, a burden, my personal burden to have um, black people become financially literate, to uh, talk about uh, corporations, tax laws, uh, uh, forming LLCs as natural as talking about the football stats and, and sports and things like that. Um, to understand that um, how these structures work, you know, if we're stuck in a, a blue collar uh, position in American society now, you know, let, let's get that education going to the point, you know, let's get motivated to come out of that and be more, have more control. These businesses and all this, it's about control. It's not so much about tangible things, you know, because see what what the what the financially literate do and what what those uh, these people do. They create these entities, and the entities then become uh, are just like slaves, and they go make the money. They buy things. It's an incredible uh, process. But it's not, I, th I feel like it's un-American not to teach that in school. If, if that's the way America works, then why doesn't America uh, open the doors to all ways? You keep, you want to stick me and, and condition me to get a job, get a good job. I don't, I don't want a good job. I want to be in control of my life. I don't want to work for someone else. I uh, like slavery. I want someone working for me. I got to admit, I... The way I am, I, I can't see me doing, putting another human being through slavery as America did. Uh, but I, I, I'd be okay if a business is running and I'm treating people right and, and whatnot, then I, I think I could sleep well at night. So financial literacy, along with political literacy as well. How does politics work? You know, yeah, you, the, I mean, as I speak, there are debates going on. Uh, there are people talking you know, on Capitol Hill. Uh, major decisions are being made uh, that impact my life. I have no say, no representation. I always get the decision after the fact, uh, or absent of my participation. You know, the throngs of Americans of all colors and races are going to that because they're out there working their butts off right now. And they're too tired later to come home and chime in about it. You know, uh, it's it's amazing. I'm in a I'm just in a unique space in my life where I can think on this, and I'm sure there are powers that be, especially the Sambo I got to run into uh, today, or hopefully sometime this week, uh, to tighten up that dynamic a little bit. Back to Dr. Claude Anderson, we talked about the martyrdom, assassination of Nipsey Hussle. Uh, Mr. Hussle, you know, I don't know what interest he had there in LA, but uh, I hear nothing but good things about him from black celebrities, LeBron James, Dr. Claude Anderson, you know, <clears throat> he's got exposure uh, from some of the some black uh, high-profile people around the nation. So it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see how this plays out. Maybe finally the black community will find a way to be held accountable, to find, settle their differences besides using a gun. That's behaving poorly. Keep killing off the people who are doing good for the community. 
Uh, that's a human, problematic human thing. It's happening. Jesus, you think of any martyrs uh, through history, you know, real martyrs. And it's like, you know, people doing good for the community, we kill them all. I don't, I don't understand that. It's wrong. I read three of Dr. Anderson's works. Um, he speaks about black issues, racism, and equality. He's studied, uh, obviously, more than me. I'm just regurgitating snippets of his work. First work I read was A Black History Reader, 101 Questions You Never Thought to Ask. Second book I read was Black Labor, White Wealth, Search for Power and Economic Justice. Third book I read was Powernomics and his National Plan to Empower Black America. You can find Dr. Anderson at powernomics.com. He's also, uh, you can find him hanging out at the Heritage Institute in Washington, D.C. Behind me, you see the hashtag us too is a response to the hashtag me too movement, the hashtag me too movement, essentially white women getting together and supporting each other. The black women felt they, I guess the black women felt they weren't being properly represented enough. So here's hashtag us too, and you can find in America, we always, if we're not being served or uh, exclusive enough, we can just make our own group. That's one of the beauties of America. Also, you go to Black Enough, B-L-A-G-G-E-N-U-F, have a black Facebook, uh, and this is the information age. If you found me here on YouTube, you can just Google anything, whatever your flavor, and find support and a voice. I just ask you to do due diligence and be very, you know, don't just find what you're looking for, critique the information. Um, I'm very close to Dr. Anderson's work because it was in my life, in the decades I've lived on this planet, there was this unnamed, uncategorized, resistance, pressure in my life, and boom, through a mutual friend of Dr. Anderson's that I, him and I share, uh, uh, the light came on, and it led me, it's, it led, it's opening all kinds of doors, awesome things are happening. We're going through a series now of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, and we are, um, Moving through, I'm not sure how many we've gone through, but there's 56 signers. Like we do two a day, so we're going to have 28 entries. And uh, today we have, uh, you know, the other day we had two Williams, two Bills, you know, to talk about. Today we have two governors of the same colony came up. Cause I'm going alphabetically, so this is not in any order, but it was interesting. As I opened up, started research and everything, we got two governors the same colony, Georgia. And it, this isn't any, these are mock interviews. These guys are dead. And this is not detailed, in-depth, eye-shattering research. <laughs> this is Wikipedia. I give Wikipedia a shout out for this information. Uh, so it's available to anyone online. Uh, and a little bit about Georgia. Georgia was a colony one of the southernmost colonies, uh, created to be a buffer zone to capture runaway slaves, the slaves heading south, because uh, the Florida, what we consider Florida, was a Spanish ter territory, Catholic territory, and it was loosely, it just wasn't held or managed well. You know, it was Spanish in name only, but uh, a lot of autonomous institutions came in and out of there. Uh, you find Andrew Jackson came in there at will and kidnapped the slaves back up to north to put them back in slavery. <coughs> Georgia was one of the buffers, kind of a zone that slaves had to uh, traverse to get down there. But eventually Georgia became its own uh, slave state anyway. So, you know, it wasn't like, I would think more of a fencing, a zone, as where uh, where there'd be a lack of a certain activity that they're trying to prevent coming through, but greed, man's greed, slavery, and all that. 
uh, overtook them. So Georgia was a slave state as well. Uh, so the first governor is Button Gwinnett. Uh, he's also interesting. He was born 1735, died 1777. So after the declaration and the war uh, was itself going on, he died. So that makes him one of the oldest uh, members, uh, so to speak, oh, about 40, well, 41. And then when I say oldest member back then, you know, 40s and 50s, 60s, you're getting, that's old, right? It's a whole different uh, diets, exercise, uh, attention to impurities and things like that. You know, 40s, 50s, that's old, you know, back then. So I, that's why I say he's one of the oldest because, and he's, he died soon after he's one of the oldest. There's plenty of 40-year-olds signed the declaration. Anyway, but he's English born, you know, his, in the research I did, he wasn't listed with having allegiance to any, any particular colony or state, although he ended up there in Georgia and, and all that, uh, but his birthplace is England, you know, so it shows a differenti differentiation of allegiances, how that can impact a person's allegiance of where they're born. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. You know, he out, he's assigned the Declaration of Independence, so something encouraged him to remove, extract himself from English allegiances. Uh, allegiances. He was an unsuccessful merchant. He, whatever he put his hands to business wise, just didn't go well. You know, he just had mediocre success, and uh, I'm guessing that he, like with his his English leanings and indoctrinations, he was more, um, he just wasn't readily, he might have had ties and, 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 and problematic encumbrances uh, to getting himself firmly established at a, as a colonial merchant is my uh, thing. But it, he eventually became a plantation owner, and, and this happened in the South. Therefore, he probably owned slaves. Episcopalian, so he's got these, these Protestant, you know, obvious Protestant leanings. And there, there's a line, you know, between Catholicism and Protestantism. He's, um, that was one of the factors in the war, but I, I'm still going to say the war was about uh, economic issues. And that's, that's the argument you find in the research is that they have, you know, it wasn't about fleeing religious persecutions and all the weird stories were told in grade school. It's about um, being disadvantaged economically and without representation. You know, don't you hate it when somebody makes a decision in your life? Like you get off work or you show up somewhere and you, you have an expectation of things being a certain way, but somewhere in the high echelons without your consent or knowledge, something has changed and it, uh, it just causes an encumbrance and disruption in your life. And, and and people wonder why you snap. <laughs> you know, that happened to me at work. Something I got to deal with today with this Sambo and, and all this stuff. So I, I really, you really want to make me mad, make a decision about my life without consulting me first. <laughs> That's what was going on uh, primarily in the colonies. Could have been any religion. Um, so, um, now, for him, for slavery, slavery always was. Uh, England was had a brisk business shipping slaves to the colonies to uh, gather the resources and send them back to England. So that you know, so he's immersed coming out of an immersion in slavery. He's not going to be all involved or get too uptight about 
slaves in the colonies, that that was how things were you know, on his boat ride over <laughs> to the colonies. They probably had a bunch of smelly slaves down in the hold and whatnot. And, uh, you know, and it was just a matter of course as he read the morning paper on his way <laughs> to the colonies. So um, in uh, the mock interview, I, I, I kind of uh, picture him as being incredulous that I'm asking about slavery and his relationship with God and religion and how all that plays out. You know, he, he's, she strikes me as a person who would not understand the question. He'd be very defensive, all offended by challenging uh, the institution and right of white men dominating black men. <laughs> now, uh, but as far as signing the declaration, I, I imagine that, you know, whatever little business dealings he had, whatever little successes were going on, he made it a point to resist England's hold, you know, he, he had separated from that space, so he, he doesn't want to be entangled and have England's hand on his interest, all using England's interest <laughs> over his business. He's struggling and struggling, and he's trying to get some stuff done on his personal life, and here's England sending letters and taxes and stuff on his interest. So that's uh, that was my take in my interview with Button Gwinnett. <laughs> a lot of space in uh, Georgia named after him and all that. Next one is Lyman Hall. He was the another governor. Now he wasn't right after. Uh, but interesting, these, these guys uh, knew each other. They were in the same room. Uh, uh, Button Gwinnett and, and Lyman Hall were two of three uh, Georgian signers of the Declaration of Independence. So he was uh, the governor sometime after Gwinnett. There were a few in between there. But now uh, Lyman Hall was born in Connecticut. How does he find his way way down south in Georgia? Um, I, I bet you he liked uh, the winters and the warmer weather. It's probably humid, much more humid than he would have liked probably being situated closer to the ocean. But uh, I, I imagine he, followed, he uh, found it favorable. Uh, very much in, involved with the clergy. His father was a pastor. His father apparently had some drama and stuff going on concerning his father's integrity and morality and things like that. So some, some kind of uh, drama followed him and his father. Uh, he was a Congregationalist, and he, he kind of, uh, the certain uh, congregations of which he was part, uh, migrated southward and found their way into uh, the Georgia colony, and there <coughs> is where he rested, uh, more so following the congregations and, and maintaining um, some uh, some semblance of integrity with them. Sorry, my phone was just uh, buzzing there. And um, so he um, his uh, he, he wasn't so much a merchant and, and all this stuff. He was a physician. So um, the physicians and ministers we find, mostly from the north so far, uh, either abstain from slavery or are abolitionists. Uh, we've yet to find a physician or minister uh, uh, owning slaves or being very supportive of the uh, slave Industry, we might. Who knows? We got a little ways to go. This, this is only H's. We go all the way to W's, so we got a couple more to go. Maybe we'll find a physician or a merchant, a physician or a minister, uh, wholly committed 
to encouraging slavery. But as an, as it stands now, they're either abstaining through silence or they are outright abolitionists. Um, amazing that you can find these men congregating, agreeing on anything without knifing each other. <laughs> you have 56 guys, you know. Uh, fortunately, their, their common interest, common bond was resisting England's uh, rule and control. Congregationalists, uh, autonomy of the congregation, more is more Protestant uh, veins uh, and le uh, leaves, God, Jesus, Trinity, all that, hymns, I'm sure. Uh, but the congregation was autonomous, although they were part of a big body. There was no, you know, some uh, bishop or something or someone in New York or Virginia didn't control congregations in New Hampshire or um, Maryland, let's say, uh, such like that. So uh, that was, you know, him as an, and his pastorate and his phys being a physician, I'm guessing he just encouraged people to seek God's face. You know, it had to, I think it probably had to touch him. You know, coming south and seeing so much, oh, abuse, marginalization, you know, um, had to had to kind of turn him a little bit, but I found no overt mention of him for or against slavery, the oppression, the abuse. Um, now he did sign, uh, he was the representative to the Second Continental Congress that kind of sent him up north. It was probably relief <laughs> to get away for a little while. Head up north, be a representative of uh, his parish, Sunbury, uh, I think it was St. something parish. Um, uh, there were polarizations happening there between loyalists and patriots. And the Patriots um, sent Lyman Hall as representative up to the Central Continental Congress to give that voice, lend support uh, to the growing uh, dissatisfaction with um, England's rule. Uh, so there's our two interviews today, two governors of Georgia uh, separated by a few years one dying uh, in the midst of the Revolutionary War, and uh, uh, another man, a uh, physician, minister, uh, abstaining from the slavery issue, his predecessor, but when it uh, confused that any question could be put forth about the slaves, the slave institution, industry, business always was. So what's there to question about it? What's that got to do with getting out from under England's rule? <laughs> oh, what a great experiment we're going through. So see me tomorrow, we're gonna to have a famous name, another famous name uh, that we're very much familiar with and see what See if we can find any more surprises from the signers of the Declaration of Independence. We're out of time. My name is Tomlins Nyback, and that is another episode of 365 Days Towards Racial Change, day 98 out of the way. Thank you, and we'll see you again. Bye-bye.